go out to a really uh, large audience. In fact, that's how actually I, I actually came to uh, find the organization in the first place. So we're going with the mic. Uh, hey, for, for all those of you who are back from previous events, um, super excited to have you back. Um, it's also cool just like talking to folks beforehand. I have met people who have been to these events in San Francisco where this all started uh, four or five years ago and people who have been to events in New York. Uh, and that was just uh, just a couple of you. So that's, it's really cool. And I'm also really excited that we had this going on in Austin. So before we get going, I just want to say a huge thank you to our partners the Indeed team who do all the hard work. They provide the event and the food and the drinks and the audiovisual support. And I just get to stand up here and uh, introduce the speaker and have a good time. But really, really appreciate these guys. So let's give them a big round of applause, please, for the Indeed team. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I want to just uh, give a second to uh, allow uh, one of those folks, uh, Ryan Arroyo, who is the senior product manager uh, for the Indeed incubator, or apparently our dog, uh, according to his name tag. Uh, uh, Ryan, can you want to come on up and tell us uh, what you're working on these days, indeed. For sure, hey Michael, thanks for coming everyone. Um, so yeah, so I work on the team called Incubator, and what Incubator is is a relatively new product or team at Indeed, and what we said is at, at Indeed, we're really good at micro-optimizations, and we've historically, that's been the thing that we've done really well. At any given time on Indeed, there's probably over 100 experiments, changing colors, changing font sizes, doing all those things, but then we realized that there's only so much you can do with micro-optimizations. You're gonna find local maximums where there's just new buckets of areas that you just can't get through an experiment. So we needed to, to find innovation somewhere else. And so we started the incubator and the whole objective of it was to unlock all the ideas that our employees had of all, uh, in all roles, sales, product, CS, design, and gave them a form to say, hey, come pitch an idea that you have for how to make it indeed better by either providing more value to job seekers or employers, and you could have an opportunity to create a new product at Indeed. And so about two years ago, I did that, and I pitched a, a product, and I was already a product manager at Indeed, and it got funded, and, and it works like a startup where you meet with the senior leadership team, and they, they fund these different levels of funding, and you get to work your way through the ranks and build your product like a small business. And so. It's one of the coolest things at Indeed is that as a product manager, you have this opportunity to change your own trajectory through uh, innovation and entrepreneurship inside of a company that has a lot of things that create instant on success, like our thousands of sales folks. So it's been uh, transformative for me and, and it will continue to be transformative for Indeed um, as more and more of these products and, and ideas trickle through and, and take us through the next many years. Uh, so it's great to be here, and uh, we're hiring at Indeed, of course. It's actually pretty hard to find Indeed jobs on Indeed, um, but you can find it by clicking at the link at the very bottom. Uh, don't search it, it won't work. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, it, it, would you work at Indeed at the bottom, and you can look by our offices and role, and uh, there's a bunch of product open positions open today in Austin, um, as well as many of our other offices. So thanks again for coming, enjoy the talk. Ryan, thank you. Uh, Someone I didn't know, you can't find Indeed jobs on Indeed. It's pretty, pretty interesting. <laughs> All right, gang, so just, just real quickly, um, right, so welcome. Hey, this is, our, this is our agenda for this evening. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, then at the end of that, you're going to get a chance to ask him questions, which a lot of times is, is my favorite part. You can ask him questions about the presentation or, or his previous experience, which I'll describe to you in a minute. And then another benefit of coming is we always allow about five minutes at the end of this for shout outs, right? It's, it's a really great way to connect with the community. So if you are hiring, if you are looking to raise money, you're looking for your next co-founder, you're looking for beta testers, uh, I'll ask you to kind of come up and, and line up at the end. You've got 10 seconds to make your pitch. And the first two brave people will get this uh, amazing, fabulous uh, products account branded Moleskine notebook to kind of reward you for your uh, social courage. So. Uh, that's that. Um, if, if you're not familiar with Products Account, um, the, the organization was started back in about 2014 by SC Mawadi. Uh, we do these in several cities now. We also have a uh, monthly podcast uh, and a blog, so I hope you'll go check those out as well. And finally, before I forget, 
Um, like any good product manager, we, we take feedback very, very seriously. So you will all be getting a survey at the end of this. Um, we read all those and react to them and take them very seriously, as do all of our speakers. We kind of live and die by net promoter score. So really appreciate you taking take it a couple minutes uh, afterwards to fill it out for us. So thank you. Um, just a little bit about uh, our speaker tonight, right? So Mark Pidnowski, uh has deep experience. Here we go. Where is he? There we go. He, he's got deep experience in building and bringing new B2B products to market and most importantly, conducting user research, which is what we're talking about tonight. So he is currently the Senior Director of Product Management at Experience Experian Consumer Services. Uh, in this role, he is helping over 300 businesses protect 60 million customers uh, by building enterprise-level identity, credit, and data breach cybersecurity products, which I think we all know in today's world is no, no small task, uh, and it's a pretty big deal. Um, relevant to tonight's talk, he has conducted a whopping 1,200 user interviews uh, and growing over the past several years, which is pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, and he's done this while building products, including like software and hardware products. And that's what we're gonna be chatting about tonight. But before Experian, uh, Mark's been, been in the game for a while. He's held a variety of product and executive roles in a bunch of companies, including Capital One Digital Commerce, HonestPolicy.com, uh, this is a comparison shopping engine for consumer insurance where Mark was the CMO. He was also the co-founder and the CEO of SoMark Innovations, which is a venture-backed life science company, and before that was a consultant at Gallup Consulting. Uh, he's got a degree from Washington University in St. Louis, where he also was their commencement speaker. Um, he is a very busy dad, and I don't know how he finds time to do all the following things, but he's also a blogger. He hosts the Products Account podcast, which is sort of a theme-based series where he interviews a lot of our fellow product managers around Austin, and that's really cool if you enjoy this. I think you'll enjoy that as well. Uh, he's very active in several nonprofits uh, in a variety of roles from director, mentor, and teacher. He's got uh, a bundle of patents and applications in everything from animal marketing devices to business intelligence tools. He's won multiple awards for his products and businesses. You know, uh, just one of those was Young Entrepreneur of the Year by the Federal Small Business Administration. And he's a frequent speaker on topics ranging from entrepreneurship to emerging technologies. And then last but certainly not least, like I'm really grateful to uh, have gotten to know Mark a little bit because he is also a frequent attendee uh, at these events, which is really cool. Um, but this is a story that I haven't heard yet, and I just want to say I think we're all really lucky to have Mark coming speaking with us tonight. So Mark, let's give him a big round of applause and hear a great story. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Give me a second, I gotta switch the slides. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you to Indeed for hosting us tonight. Um, I believe that not only is it okay to ignore your users, but that sometimes we actually want to do it a little bit more than we might think. Now, I want to be very clear about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Um, I believe we should always listen to our users in an empathetic, neutral, intentional manner. But what we do with that feedback after we gather it is a completely different thing. And that's where I think it's okay to ignore. Um, I also believe that making decisions based upon our user feedback is probably one of the most critical skills of a product manager, and that's what we're gonna dive into tonight. Now, Shakespeare said to be or not to be, that is the question. I think to follow or not to follow, that is the question asked by product managers everywhere. Um, my purpose tonight is simply perpetual learning. I'm gonna share a lot of my biggest product mistakes and the lessons that I've learned from them so that you might learn from them, make smarter mistakes, share your learnings, and that we, as a product manager community, might somehow reach our penultimate, which is to anticipate and fulfill the, the needs and wants of all users. So that's the purpose here tonight. And you need to know that I am human and I am horribly biased based upon my own personal experiences, which are different from everybody else's here. So anything that you take tonight, know that you need to discount it so that in the future, it, to determine if, when, or how you might ever apply it to your situation. So please come up with your appropriate discount. And my discount is really based upon the past products that I've worked on. 
So for one was a biocompatible RFID ink tattoo for cattle, um, a stereo camera to actually count cattle, uh, which you'd be surprised is very difficult to do, um, a machine that put a tattoo on the tail of a mouse in an automated manner, um, a marketplace that connected tutors with uh, students, and actually we found out our customer wasn't students but their parents, um, Fly Benjamin, which was a, a, a shopping site with automated price triggers for buying flights. Um, Alpha Race, which was which capitalized on the solo mo movement back in 2011. Um, Spend Analytics, which was a marketing intelligence tool for merchants based upon transaction data. TrueLift, which was uh, attempting, but we did not, solve the problem of online offline attribution. Honest Policy, a comparison shopping engine, which was all about helping users find and shop for insurance based upon value, which is a function of price and quality, whereas most of the time we just do it based upon price. And then currently at Experian in a B2B uh, to see white label format on credit education, identity theft protection, and then also the Monday Karma blog. Uh, our agenda for tonight, I'm gonna share one monster story, the framework that I learned from that that I use today, a second story, the framework from that, um, my favorite, a top 10 list of things that I've learned of conducting user interviews over the past like 15 years, and then Q&A. Um, I actually don't think we need to keep Q&A till the end. If people wanna ask questions throughout, like let's do it, it'll be more fun, um, and we'll go from there. Sound fair? All right. Story number one. So I was at Capital One Labs, and we were asked to figure out how to create more and more meaningful relationships with national merchants, national retailers, um, explore new business models, and we had a hunch that we could use transaction data to do this. So we interviewed about 30 different retailers, and this was everybody from Whole Foods here, to Men's Warehouse, to Patagonia, to Buffalo Wild Wings, to Neiman, to Nordstrom, to Saks, I mean mostly Fortune 500 retailers. We essentially talked to people that were in marketing and then one degree away. So FP&A or financial planning and analysis and then store operations. And for us, this was discovery research, right? There were no hypotheses, it was just what are the problems, needs, and wants. And we realized that there was really one big problem, was that merchants understood what their customers did inside of their store they didn't understand what they did outside of their store. And that was extremely important and valuable for them to know. So we set off to figure out how to solve that problem. And we actually came up with two products. Now they were part of a larger product called Spend Analytics, but essentially there were actually two distinct that could be standalone products. One was called Customer Insights, the other was Competitor Insights. And in Customer Insights, it was all customer focused. And so the use cases, one of them was find my best friend. So this is what's called a co-marketing relationship. If you're JetBlue and you want to find a co-marketing program with a restaurant, do you want to be with Panera or Buffalo Wild Wings? Another one was we called Speak My Language. So a lot of brands do what's called regional or hyper-local marketing, where they actually want the copy of their advertising to speak to the local community. You imagine the copy you use in LA is different than the copy you use in Peoria, Illinois versus New York, right? So our data could help them with that. And the last one was called Where's Waldo? So in Where's Waldo, the situation is you have an almost lapsed customer segment and you want to prevent them from going from almost lapsed to lapsed. So where are they? Where do you reach them with a message so that you can prevent them from lapsing? The other product was called Competitor Insights. So very competitor focused. And one of the use cases here was called Leaky Bucket. So Leaky Bucket was, am I losing customers, which ones and, and to whom, um, cheating on me, which was, uh, if, imagine that you're a retailer in uh, you have, say, shoes, and you know you're not getting all of the spend of your customers in shoes. You know they're going to of some of your competitors, but how much? How much are they cheating on you? And what can you do in terms of your loyalty programs to fix that? And then lastly, the biggest bang for the buck, which was help me understand what is my share of wallet and where do I have the largest share of wallet opportunity so that when I'm looking at allocating my marketing spend, I don't just blindly go a third, a third, a third, but I actually say 50%, 40%, 10% by where I have the largest share of wallet opportunity. So these are the two products we knew that we wanted to build. The problem for us was which do we build first? We couldn't build them both. And we knew that if we didn't get it right and we didn't choose the correct one first, we may not have a chance to build the second one. So that was the dilemma that we faced. And we ultimately chose wrong. Um, and I'll show you the framework that I came up with that I think would have been helpful 
and prevented us from making the wrong decision. So we chose to build competitor insights first. And we did that for a couple reasons. One, it was, it was sexy. There were other products that were out there. There was a lot of excitement from users. But what we didn't realize was that their users' expectations was actually extremely high because there were so many other products that were already out there. So we said, yes, we're going to we're, we're build them both, but which one do we do first? And it should have been customer insights. And why was because there was more green on this framework. And I'll tell you the and in a minute. So here in terms of the trade-off map. So it's trade-off heat map is what I call it. On the y-axis, this is basically your user's expectations of a new solution compared to current and past solutions. And on the x-axis, it's how much better your new solution is relative to current solutions. So when you map this, and you basically, this is, works pretty well for trade-off decisions. You want to be out of the orange, or out of the orange or the red, and in the green. So if, if one of your options is in, the, is in the red, you probably want to ignore it. If you're in the yellow, orangish area, you probably want to take some caution. And here you can see that you can get here multiple ways. There can be low expectations, and you're only a little bit better. There can be medium expectations, and you're moderately better. Or there can be really high expectations, and you're still a lot better. But it's kind of like a one-to-one. -one. There's no leverage here. There's no five-to-one opportunity. And where you really want is to be in all green, where there's low expectations, and you're moderately better or significantly better, right? And so for us, we ended up building competitor insights first, but we didn't realize that expectations were actually significantly higher. And what that meant was, once we launched, that users almost, there was a much higher bar for us to pass in order for them to use it and for us to really exceed their expectations. Whereas if we would have gone something that was lower with customer insights, they had almost nothing to compare to. Or what they did have to compare to, it was so trivial that we were significantly better than them. And the one thing that, um, I, where I said the and part of not only do you want to be in more green, but there's something that we didn't realize is that users that have high expectations, it's almost like they're a no but user. They're constantly, they're, they're insatiable. You cannot please them. And it's almost as if they're looking for reasons why it's not going to work for them. Whereas if it's somebody with low expectations, it's a little bit more of a yes and person. They're almost cheering you on. It's a little bit more forgiving. And if you think about this, you might score yourself as like 5x better than everybody else. But a user who has low, your low expectations might actually score you like a 7 or an 8x better. So you actually get this little drift or almost like a curve when you're dealing with low expectations. So let's look at an example that everybody knows. So I plotted Uber. So try to go back in time to before Uber existed. So past solutions were a horse. Current solutions, taxi or car service. And there's a new solution called Uber. And it was actually called Uber Cab when it was released. And I would argue that at that time, users' expectations were extremely low. And that Uber was actually significantly better than was out there. I mean, think about it. You don't have to hail a cab. You don't have to stand in the rain. You don't have to fight to get in the cab. You don't get in the cab and then feel like you're literally a prisoner in handcuffs because there's a bulletproof glass window. You have a seat is plastic. And then when you get to where you need to, you don't have to worry about haggling over a tip or being delayed by payment. You just get out of the car. So I would argue I was actually significantly better. But now still assume that you're Uber. You're the PM at Uber. And V1's out there. And you've got to figure out what's released next. What are your options? Uber Lux, Uber X, Uber Pool. Now, I didn't work at Uber. I don't know how they looked at this. I don't know, I don't know what they chose. But this is how I would have applied this situation with the framework. I would argue that Uber Lux is a slightly different segment, right? Because it's more <coughs> premier somebody who wants to pay a bunch more money. Uber X and Pool is somebody who actually wants to save a lot of money. There's slightly different use cases in that pool is there's going to be more people in the car, whereas X, it might only be you in a car. But it's still somebody who wants to get somewhere very cheaply. So I'm curious, did anybody out here work at Uber or have any significant others who worked at Uber and has some insight onto where this might have actually been plotted? No? Anybody else think that they would they would have plotted this differently? I think that might be a, a symptom 
of the yeah. solution, but I don't think it's a requirement that it's more innovative. I mean, look, most right. things that are gonna be 10x better than a current solution are probably gonna be innovative, yeah. right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Like, you could compete on quality. It could be something that's existing, you just drastically increase the quality, and therefore it could be 10x better. So a few notes on using the trade-off map. Number one, it's a guide, not a command line. Uh, number two, I think it really helps you focus on making something that people want and will use. Um, it does not address any engineering or data risks or anything else, so it's limited in that situation. And also, you cannot believe your own X. You cannot believe your own idea of how much better your product is than somebody else. You need to go find five friends who will call you out on your BS and tell you where your product actually sits on that axis. And lastly, I think it works pretty well for trade-off decisions. So the difference between a trade-off decision and maybe one that's not, which we'll talk about in a minute, is that trade-off decision, you're probably working with the same set of users. Whereas if it's a pivot decision, you're probably working with a different set of users. Any questions before we go to story two? Yes. The other thing too is like when I create that, like I don't know how many different products they were thinking about at the time. Like you open up your app now, I think there's six or seven, right? And there's actually a few that have changed. So I don't know what they were thinking at the time and what actually, what else you, what else you would have plotted on there. Because the other thing you could look at it too is you could plot that and you could make it um, a standalone or you could make it relative to your choices too. All right, story two. Mouse tails. You know, in my, my entire life, I still think the most fun I ever had in terms of answering the question of what do you do was I tattoo mice. Um, and I got to do that for like three or four years, and it was actually a blast. But there's about a, there's about 100 million mice that are used in preclinical research annually. About half of those mice are genetically modified. All genetically, all genetically modified mice have to be identified and all, all mice that were used to breed that genetically modified mouse also have to be uniquely identified. So it's a bigger market than you would probably think. And for us, we realized, and we sort of got pulled into the market, but we realized that all we had to do was provide, research with, provide researchers with the ability to identify and track their mice in a reliable and a simple manner. And so that's what we did. Uh, it's an enterprise company, hardware, and we are optimizing for revenue. And if you're curious about how to tattoo a mouse tail in 20 seconds or less, you put them in this wonderful little restraint. Um, can anybody guess why it's red? They can't see red light, so for them it's dark inside and dark makes it comfortable for them. Um, you insert a little disposable ink slide. It was a razor, razor blade business model, so that little ink slide there was the blade of our, of our, of our model. You put them into a little machine, which we internally nicknamed the Easy Bake Oven, because it kind of looks like that. But inside of the machine is a robotic arm that moves X, Y, Z, and theta over the curvature of the tail. It applies the tattoo, and it comes out, and you have a tattoo on the tail of your mouse. Uh, this font was actually extremely difficult for us to come up with. And for the designers in the room or anybody else who loves typeface, so much so that we almost had to commission our own typeface to make it work. I remember one night uh, with my then, I think, girlfriend, uh, I got to choose what we watched on Netflix and I chose the Helvetica documentary. And as a PSA, if you ever have to get to choose a movie with your significant other who is not a designer and doesn't really care or an architect, don't choose the Helvetica documentary. Um, but it was so important for us because the zero, the eight, the D, and the O were extremely similar. And if for some reason the needle didn't work at one point or some of the epidermis flaked off and we didn't get the correct depth and we realized we were dealing with 1.5 mils 
of an inch. That's like one one thousandth of an inch was our target zone or our margin of error for this depth, right? And we could not, we could not afford that to happen. So we had to come up, we, had, we searched many, many months to find this typeface that would work for us. Okay, back to the decision. So we had to decide between three or four characters on the tail. And the reason why was because we looked in all of our market research, there are multiple customer segments. So there's breeders. Those are companies that breed mice and sell them. There's CROs or contract research organizations which do outsourced tests for companies. Uh, there's big pharma, which we all know. There's big biotech companies. There's medical research universities. And then there's the government, such as the NIH. And everybody that we talked to, and I probably, this is where I did my first, I don't know, probably like 300 user interviews over these years. Um, everybody said three characters was fine, except for one of the breeders. And this one breeder owned 50% of the breeding market, Charles River Laboratories. They said they needed four. We tried to understand why. We didn't really get a great answer. We asked everybody else, everybody else says three. These guys are saying four. Why? They're like, I ah, don't worry about them. They just think that they can do whatever they want because they're the market leader. Okay. Well, we decided to build three characters. And to this day, I still regret that decision. And I'll walk through why. Now, thankfully, the company was still successful. It got sold to a PE firm. It's still around today. Um, but ultimately, I think it was the wrong decision. So let's, well, let's look at this framework. So I created this framework to analyze from really a business or a project success perspective. If you make a decision, what are going to be the impacts of those decisions, of, the, of those decisions, and which impacts do you want to avoid? So here, there's three different impacts that I looked at. One was less time to figure it out, figure out the product, the market, the distribution. Two is just a smaller market opportunity overall. And three is that it will result in more risk or more resources to be required. And for us, three character tattoo resulted in less time in a smaller market. And then a four character tattoo uh, resulted in more risk or more resources needed, but that was it. So if we look at this, so the less time is all about, you actually have less time to figure it out. It means your timeline's shorter. It means people just have less patience with you. The smaller market could actually mean smaller revenue opportunity, fewer customers, fewer segments to go after. The more risk or resources, risk could be anything from legal to IP to data risk. Resources could be people to dollars to whatever you want it to be. But these, I looked at the three sort of negative impacts that you would want to avoid when you're making one of these decisions. And in essence, I look at it as you want to be outside of the Venn diagram or outside of the triangle, which would be green. Follow the feedback that you're getting. If it's yellow, take some caution. If it's orange, probably you're in two, probably ignore. And if it's red, it means that you have less time, a smaller market, and more risk. Why in the world are you listening to your user feedback, even if it's telling you to do this? So in that situation, ignore. Now, why did it look like this for us? Well, Charles River Laboratory was the leader of the breeding market. So when they found out that we were defying them, and we were building three, tat three character tattoos instead of four, they now didn't want to help us out. We didn't get a PO from them on the books. They would badmouth us to the industry. So they're not going to help us at all. And in fact, they might go out of their way to not help us. What it also meant was it wasn't just a smaller market from a revenue perspective. Our story was smaller. Our story to current investors, our story to employees that we were or folks that we were trying to recruit, our story to other customers was smaller, or to Charles Rivers customers who buy from Charles River, who sometimes buy pre-identified mice <coughs> from Charles River. So it wasn't, for us, it wasn't linear. It was actually non-linear, and we didn't realize that. And because of that, also, our, our board, for some reason, gave us less time. Because we were telling them that three was going to be easier, and it was, but now we had significantly less time to figure it out and a smaller market. People are willing to give you more time if you have a larger, which you have a larger market to go after and a better story to tell, but not when it's shrinking. So there's a few notes on using this triangle. Number one, um, guide, not commandment again. Two, this I think focuses more on the business or the project success. You don't have to be running a startup to use this. Even if you're in a large company like, the, like Indeed or, or at Experian, you are still a business or there's still a project that's, that can be successful or not successful. You still have stakeholders. They may not be your board, but they're still stakeholders. You still have to get people on your team. You still have a budget to manage. You still have two developers or maybe you have 10 developers. So I think this can still be applied regardless of the size of the company that you're at. 
Um, three, this does address the engineering data financing risks that the other framework does not. And there's a fourth thing here. There's actually a flaw in the framework as it's been described, and I'm curious if anybody has spotted the flaw yet. I know there's a few former management consultants in the room, and I would expect them to have found it already. No flaws? Well, I'm not calling it a flaw, but like what, what is the green working on in this framework? Green is still, you can, uh, here there is basically a following this decision or making this choice, there is essentially no negative impact and therefore feel free to follow the feedback that is telling you to take this path. Yes? If it doesn't weigh the relative badness of the impact, then maybe by trying to talk about this as well. Excellent. Um, it does not at all. It assumes that all three impacts are weighted equally, and they're not. So if you were to use this, you need to figure out what do the size of your circles look like? Because they're going to be different. And you're probably going to need to get a few people to sanity check you on that so that you're actually weighing them correctly. And lastly, I do think that this works well for trade-off or pivot decisions. And as I mentioned earlier, the difference between the two is I think in a trade-off decision, you're typically dealing with the same set of users. In a pivot decision, you're probably looking at two different sets of users. Any questions on framework two before we jump to the top 10? Okay. Top 10. So this is my top 10 list of things that I've learned from doing all the user interviews of what works well, what doesn't work well, and sometimes almost like as a checklist for me. So for number one, a real intimacy is one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, when you do an interview, you want to be you and the other person. You don't want to interview multiple people because then they're going to have a competition of who says the best thing or you know, speaking over the other person. And you don't want to intimidate the person that you're interviewing with having somebody else beside you. Right? So one-on-one -on -one is real intimacy. Number two, call me maybe. Um, I know a lot of people think that in-person is the best way to do interviews, but I actually have found phone to be extremely helpful for a couple reasons. One, you can scale faster. You can reach your ideal person because they're not located where you are. And it's easier to coordinate and schedule so you're moving faster. Um, number two, people sometimes are more willing to share certain things when they can hide behind a phone than when they're in person, and it's easier for you to take notes. No more why. Um, I learned this a little bit from experimentation and also from reading a book by a guy who did counterintelligence at the FBI for about 30 years, and that why questions make the person feel defensive. So how, what, tell me more, help me understand is a much more neutral question that you can ask a user. Um, notes, notes, and notes. Look, you, you can't remember everything. Um, you will need to refer back to your notes later when you're dealing with a trade-off decision. Or when you're putting slides together for an internal or external presentation, you're going to want to pull some quotes from some users to illustrate some things. So having extremely detailed notes will, will benefit you in the long run. Um, number five, be curious like a child. Um, if you've ever done user interviews when you knew the space versus when you didn't know the space, you probably understand the challenge that you can have when you bring those preconceived notions into those interviews and the biases that that can create. And you have to figure out how to go back in time and actually embrace your inner three or four year old to be so curious, so just full of awe, so neutral and willing to explore anything and everything. And that's where I think you'll uh, be able to pull some things out of users that you normally wouldn't. Number six is one of my favorite, and that is simply silence. When you figure out when is the appropriate time in an interview to just be silent and let the other person talk, they get nervous and they just want to fill the air, or they feel like they need to talk. And either they're going to tell you something that you didn't think you could ask, that you didn't think that they would ever tell you, or that you didn't think to ask. And look, you can't do this all the time. You can't start out with it. But there are times where you can just be silent and just wait and see what happens. And the risk is extremely low. Um, but it's kind of, it's a little bit of a game of, of whoever talks first sort of loses, in a sense. Um, seven is don't lead a horse to water. So I believe in actually writing out all of your questions in advance and looking at them and having some other people look at them to figure out like where are your leading questions and how can you avoid that. Eight is 50-50 cohorts. So when you do iterative uh, interviews, I like to have uh, from my first group um, to my second group, I like to have some of the people in that second group from the first group and some to be brand new. And you keep on doing that. When you get to your fifth round of it, 
you have people from the very beginning, so you have this continuity and you can build with them. But what you also do is you allow yourself to hedge against that person who created from the first one emotional ownership. And so now they actually want you to succeed and they're not being as candid as they, as they normally would. And you're also not getting that kind of first time user experience. So when you can compare that against the people who are brand new, you can tease out the difference between the two and see if you're getting any flaws in your data. Uh, nine, <laughs> dealing with uh, trying to figure out what people are willing to pay or how to price something. I think whether you're trying to do anchoring of it's gonna be a million dollars, oh, what would you would be willing to pay? or what do you think this is worth, or even conjoint analysis are extremely difficult. Type of most users are terrible at predicting the future of what they would do, especially when it involves them taking out their credit card. And I think you can really only look to what they're currently doing and what they've done in the past that they've actually paid for and weight that much higher than what they're telling you of what they would do in the future. And number 10, um, I created my own acronym called Finissimo, which is an acronym for functional, emotional, and social. And I believe that when doing these research and you're trying to understand the problem of your user very deeply, we typically start and stop at just the functional problem. But if you can understand the emotional problem and the social problem, you will understand the user at a problem at a much deeper level, which I think will allow you to create, to make much better decisions going forward. So an example of that, um, there's somewhat of a famous example by uh, Clayton Christensen where he talks about the milkshake at McDonald's. Right, so the milkshake, and this was milkshakes for breakfast. The milkshake, the functional problem was uh, fill my belly and so that I feel full and I'm not hungry when 10 a.m. hits. Okay, so just give me food, keep me satiated. That's kind of functional problem. Um, the emotional problem was make me feel like I'm being healthier than eating a bunch of donuts or a pastry. And the social problem was allow me to get to work and not have crumbs all over my clothing from driving in the car and trying to drive and eat at the same time so that I don't look like a slob. Um, a similar one, another example of that is Tesla, right? So it's just a car. Functional problem, get me from point A to point B. The emotional is make me feel good about caring about the environment and being green. And the social aspect is give me something that's beautiful and makes me feel sexy when I'm driving it so that I can stand out amongst my peers and I can be more fashionable than them. And I think when, if you were to force yourself to ensure that you actually understand the functional, emotional, and social, you will find out that you actually understand your users much more deeply than you ever thought that you could. Thank you. Um, I, I hope that some of this was helpful. I hope that you will take whatever mistakes and lessons that you learned from them over the years and share it with other folks in the community so that we can one day reach the penultimate of being able to anticipate and fulfill the needs and wants of all of our users. So thank you. No questions? I guess we get to go home. Oh, we got one. Um, hey, Mark. Oh, oh sorry. Hey, uh, Grant Demery. My question is about your, your comments on not using why and instead having what or how or tell me more mm -hmm. questions. Um, since that conflicts with the mainstream advice, I'm really curious if anyone's tested that. In, in other words, I bet it's a pretty easy experiment to run and say, all right, what results does the same level of interviewer get with why versus with these other questions? Uh, I haven't run any experiments. Um, I got that from a guy who wrote the book. Uh, his last name is Voss. It's never split the difference. He was 30 years FBI counterintelligence for hostage negotiation. And that's where I got it from. And so I started using it. And I found it, I thought, to be more effective. Could I have been biased from reading that and then using it? Perhaps. But I haven't seen any data on that. And I haven't conducted anything up to like a true A-B test. Well, I'm really interested. I have, a, I have a bunch of user interviews in my near future. So I think I'm going to do the experiment. Well, I are you going to share your results with us? Uh, I will. 
All right. I look forward to that. Thanks. Other questions? Or I, I got one while people are thinking. So, Mark, in your example about the the three character or four character tattoo decision, yeah. I mean that was super clear in the framework. But as I think on that, like presumably an enormous amount of user research got you to the point where it was like an A B decision. And I, it seems like you've reflected and you feel like you made a mistake, you should have gone for. But I guess, like, as you look back on that whole process, I know this is a very open question, but do, do you feel like there were other important choices you made in the user research that led up to that? And then, for example, like, like one, one aspect of that question would be, if you had never asked Charles River whether they wanted three or four, do, do you think they would have been happy with three? Well, we ended up giving them, we tried to sell them three, and they basically told us to pound sand. They eventually ended up buying it later, but it took like two more years before they would. Um, I don't think it would have been possible to not ask Charles River. I mean, throughout the entire time, everybody knows that Charles River, um, they are the number one player in the Breva market. They have 50% market share. Um, and from a mind space perspective, or even a brand, brand equity, it's probably more than 50%. So to be able to tell Anybody in the space or our board that were we haven't talked to Charles River wouldn't have been acceptable. But I mean, you also asked, was there anything leading up to that? Um, I don't know. Um, you, you because it's hardware. Like at some point, you decided we're doing three or we're doing four, and it's character. I, I feel like there's so many decisions you made. I just wonder if there are other research. Yeah like decisions you made that got you to that point, you know? I'll think about that, I don't know. Okay. Um, I mean, hardware is different, right? Like the, our iterations were one week, right? Like we would come figure out what we wanted to do. Our mechanical engineer would draw it in CAD. We'd send the files out to the machine shop and a week later we'd get the parts. And when you get the parts, they're never right. The tolerances are always a little off. So you've got to sand, you've got to file, you've got to fix before you can even then take it, integrate it with your machine and then go do a test. So the three versus four, it was, there was, you make the decision and there is no looking back, which is a huge difference with software and why I still have some pretty deep scars from hardware and haven't gone back and probably won't. Have you tried applying the frameworks to some recent decisions where it actually worked? Probably Did none that I can share yeah. with my current role. I'll think about, um, I'll think about it. I don't know that I can share any in the current role. Um, but I'll see if I can't anonymize them, so give me a second. Um, I haven't used them in presentations internally, so I guess not yet. Um, I don't know, I mean, we would use it, I guess we, we could use it like within the product team. I don't know that I would necessarily go outside the product team with it. I think it's maybe depends, right? If you have an executive who is former product, then yes, but maybe. Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, Mark, great presentation. Um, I recently followed two of your 10 uh, tips over there with uh, being silent and uh, really uh, not asking why, but more asking for education. I was doing a competition for the city of Austin um, for the reverse pitch thing, and I don't know anything about the asphalt industry at all. Yeah. And um, the, <coughs> our potential customer was uh, selling to local asphalt manufacturers this uh, binding solution that binds the asphalt together. Mm -hmm. So I called and asked uh, somebody on the field uh, that, that was just working there, willing to talk to me, uh, w went through my spiel, and I asked him, um, you know, what what's your single biggest um, like problem right now as far as getting the bitumen and that, that binding solution? And you know, if there was somebody else, some new player in the field, w where do you see the biggest difference being? And uh, right now, I know that rubber is being used on roads, but what if we used plastic? And so um, they kind of, uh, because I asked more from an educational standpoint, um, they were willing to talk to me more and more as far as like, you know, here's 
here's all what you need to know. And uh, our biggest thing is price. Right now, um, they are getting it for uh, $300 to $350 per ton. Um, and that, if we were to go forward with this project, we're thinking of pricing it around that as well. Um, I'm kind of wondering, how do you kind of go back to that same potential customer for the second round with that new pricing? And like, what's the conversation that, that you should be having? Should you be having a, here's our solution, here's what it does, here's the price, are you willing to test run this? Or you know, what's the kind of conversation should I be having? Should I not even mention price? So one, I think you mentioned something that I, I didn't have in there, but I've also done in the past, and I call it the Columbo approach. Does anybody remember the show Columbo back in the day? I remember, like, the guy was a genius, but he acted like he was, like, he had the education of a kindergartner. And that approach is extremely disarming to people, and if you just take that, just help me learn. I'm, I'm so, com like, I don't understand. Like, can you just teach me? Um, people are very willing to provide that. I guess my question is, do you know what they want to optimize for? Do they care about performance or price or like what, what, do, they, what, what do they care about? If you, could you put them like in a stacked ranked order? Yep, yep. Um, they, they care about price and uh, the delivery of the material uh, for sure. Um, like within the industry, if they can get it locally, um, they're willing to go that approach versus having the, the product being transported from wherever Shell is located. Do you know why they care about that? I just asked the why question. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I know why they care about the, it? The delivery piece, do you know why they care about that? Is it because they've had like missed orders in the past or they have really tight timelines? You know, uh, I don't know too much about okay. transporting uh, these, this type of material, but yeah. it's like a crude oil, uh, crude oil like type of product. Mm -hmm. So uh, transporting that back and forth must be uh, somewhat like money related and then um, as far as permits or uh, like having it back and forth being stored. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking as far as like storage goes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think as far as like the price piece, right? If you're telling me that number one, they care about price mm -hmm. and is this essentially a commodity or is it linked to a commodity market? Um, I don't know raw materials. Mean. Okay, I mean, so like if it is linked to like commodity prices, mm -hmm. then it's gonna be tough, mm -hmm. right? Um, but on the delivery piece, if they care about something related to delivery, such as it has to be at a location by a certain time, a certain date, or like things like orders just can't be late, mm -hmm. then I wonder if you can compete and differentiate on that, which gotcha. in theory, I would assume there's a downside to them not getting it on time, and in theory, they would pay mm -hmm. be willing to pay a premium on it. But even if that doesn't matter, then I think the one of the few things you have left is customer service. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that customer service can be better? Um, and as far as the price piece, um, depending upon like how to have that conversation, um, you can have it from saying like, hey, this is our this is our intro pricing, right? For like first customers, it's gonna be relevant for like this period of time. Mm -hmm. um, you could price it uh, significantly higher and simply see how they react. And depending upon what your alternatives are, mm -hmm. you can simply negotiate on them and say like, okay, well like, I'm sorry, we just can't make money at anything lower, so we have to go find other customers. Gotcha. Um, but then I also would think that, do you, how many people have you talked to so far? Um, I've talked to two. Uh, okay. Two asphalt companies here yeah. in Austin before the pitch competitions. Okay, so I would also want to talk to as many other people inside of the company as you could in different mm -hmm. positions mm -hmm. so you can get more intel to find out if mm -hmm. that really is as important as they say. Mm -hmm. And then also mm -hmm. I would go interview former employees. Because former employees will be probably able or potentially willing to tell you things that current employees can't. Okay. And then you find out just how true that really is and how sensitive they really are or are not to price. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Mark. N number two in your top ten list was about you know the benefits I think of phone. Yeah. Interviews, right? Which which all like makes sense. I'm kind of nodding as I'm yeah. listening to it. But you know, as I, what occurs to me though is you, you're giving up. I think is sort of the body language, the ability to read that. I mean, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you find that to be a valuable component of interviewing after 1,200 interviews? Yeah, I think I think it can be. Um, I've actually body language is like a little. Or studying body language is almost like a little hobby of mine. Um, I think with body language, what you need to understand is that. 
everybody thinks that they can read body language and you can on some like intuitive subconscious sense, but unless you're actually trained in it, taking body language and a try and trying to apply it to user feedback is gonna be difficult. So for example, um, the, the most honest part of your body is, take a guess, anyone? Your posture, no. Face? Eyes. Eyes, hands, smile. smile, no? Your feet. Your feet are actually the most honest part on your body. And the reason why is because when you're a child and you don't like something or you don't like somebody, you make an ugly face. And your parents condition that out of you. They tell you that's not polite, you don't do that. But nobody has ever corrected your feet. So the feet are actually the most honest. So uh, you can, when you see if you're, um, if you're, uh, it's actually, I, I do this regularly at the gym because I think it's hilarious. When you see two people that are talking, especially when it's a man and a woman, um, if the toes are both, if there's, there's equal, equal weight on each foot and the toes are pointed at each other and they're basically locked in, like one here and one here, they both want to be in the conversation. They feel neutral and comfortable and they actually don't want anybody else to join. If you have one person with a foot open, it means they're waiting to get out and they're actually willing to have somebody else to come in. If you're sitting in a chair and you have one toe up, it's called sprinter's pose. It actually means you're ready to get out of the chair and get out of the situation. Um, women, it's more comfortable typically, right, for crossover and like to have uh, legs tucked behind a chair. But if men ever do that, that's extremely unnatural and not comfortable. So there's all these different things that you can learn about. But what, what's most, most important, if you're doing a user interview and you're trying to use body language, you have to understand that person's baseline. We all have a baseline. For some people, this is natural, and this means I need it. For some other people, this means I'm really ticked off. Right, or I'm defensive. So first, you have to understand the baseline. And then when you see a deviation from the baseline, you can categorize it as this was a signal of comfort or a signal of discomfort. And only then can you try to associate what was the catalyst that caused the comfort or the discomfort? And so related to that, when you're asking questions during, during interviews, if this is maybe somebody that you've interviewed five times before and you're bringing them back, or you know the person, maybe you can develop that baseline, but otherwise I think it's gonna be pretty difficult to, to actually use and, pro and um, attribute a meaningful weight to. Yeah. Oh, it's also extremely difficult to detect, to detect uh, deception in body language. Everybody thinks that they can do it, but really, really, really hard. You had a quick comment on the in-person part and then a yeah. question um, with the Charles River stuff. But I would say that like the benefit I've had from in-person, and I came from a well, lawyer and then business analyst mm -hmm. and now product, um, like business analyst stuff, gathering requirements directly from them, like what exactly am I building? Getting on the phone with them, I knew nine times out of 10 they weren't paying attention because they would just go off and yeah. I would be talking to nothing and then I'd have to do the lead the horse to water. And I'm, I like leading, I was a lawyer, yeah. but even yeah. so, I would it, instead be telling them what they want me to build instead of like asking them what they want because yeah. they just aren't paying attention. So getting the, in a room with them means they're not looking at a computer, they're not checking their email, they're actually being responsive. So it was less body language for those things and like, hey, okay, let's actually have a conversation and pay attention to each other. The other benefit that too is you can write on a whiteboard. Right? Right. Like not everybody processes auto, uh, auditorially very well, so you can draw through the whiteboard. Um, the other thing though that I would do a lot of times with phone interviews is we'd pay them. We'd give them an honorarium, whether it's a $50 Amazon card or $300, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. We would pay them straight for their time and it was like, here, we're booking an hour, we're paying for it, and when we did that, I think we, we, we still have people who would still really at times not pay as much attention, but they would pay a little bit more than they, they yeah. would pay. I guess as a business analyst, they were paying me to do that, but yeah. even so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with the Charles River part, um, so this actually fits a case I'm hitting right now pretty well, and it's sort of the opposite where the Charles River in the market is saying, no, we do three, and everyone else is stupid for doing four. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the market is saying, no, we do four but we have a contract with, let, let's say, Charles River to deliver something that either meets three or four within a certain time frame. So we have the more time risk, and we don't know if we can hit everything in there, but if we just do Charles River, then it's just gonna be Charles River. Mm -hmm. And no one else wants the three, unless For they buy long? in. 
for how long could you only do child, child rearing? I mean, is, is there exclusive? It's like a, I mean, it's a personnel that? risk, like, because we, we're going to have people work on this project and then go off to other things, and the company's offshoring the entire development team right now anyway, so yeah. it's either do everything all at once, or at some point, we're just going to get something out there that one Charles River can use, yeah. and maybe people will buy in later, because they're like, no, everyone else just doesn't know what they're doing yet, mm -hmm. and we do. That, that's possible. The other thing too, remember with our four and three, if we would have built three, we actually also satisfied four. S excuse me, the opposite. The if opposite. we built four, yeah. we would have satisfied three. But only if you build three, you don't satisfy four. Um, so I guess in your situation, like how would you plot this on here? I mean, building the three option for this one would still be a smaller market because it's basically one, even though they're huge. And it would be more, it would be less time, but only a tiny little bit less time to do. Um, so it still falls in the argument of like, is not that much more risk to build four because I know it's still gonna satisfy three, it's just gonna take us a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, it just don't know if we can get it built in the time for the contract and that's where the time becomes What's an issue. What's the penalty if you don't get it built in time? Oh, they get to not pay our licensing until we build it. And I don't know what, what company this is at too, but also like I, don't, I wonder like how stable of a company is this? Right? Like for us in that situation, we were a pre-revenue startup. We had 18 yeah. POs on the books, but we hadn't booked the net blood revenue yet. No, I mean, this so is a 30 year old company with okay. enough recurring revenue. Right, and I assume like if you screw up, like would, what's the impact of the company? Uh, Chances are delayed revenue recognition is the biggest thing because the cost of this one customer like migrating to another solution because this one thing wasn't done in time, like just completely going away, is pretty slim. Okay. So it sounds like it's low risk. Yeah. Low risk and also the impact is also relatively low. And it's not gonna sink the company, it's not gonna destroy Ernest's guidance. It's not going to result in 50 people getting laid off. Right, it's just gonna result in that one client screaming at me. Have they screamed at you in the past? No, they screamed at my manager. <laughs> what happened? Mostly nothing, we went back to the VP of product and he's like, yeah, they're just being unreasonable. Let's get some more user, user research and try to convince <laughs> them again. Yeah, if you were to bring the research from others to them in a manner, you think they would just say that? I mean, we bought it, we brought it through just like analogy and quotes, and they're like, no. Nope. Let's take it from there again. So maybe you just need to like amass more data. Yeah. Or figure out a way to build more of that. Dude, why would they care what the, uh, I just asked a why question. Why do they care what the other people say? Or do they care? Like, why would they listen to the other people? Or the other, their, their competitors? Um, well, I'm in legal software, so they are competitors, but also like to the extent that they help legal department departments actually compete with each other, they they don't, I guess. Yeah. Um, they just think they're right about everything financial. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's the fact that like it involves you going to law firms and we have a lot of the other clients have a good relationship with law firms. Thank you. Um, 
So you need to attract uh, researchers or product people to do interviews for you? Ah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody wants to do an interview with you. How much are you paying them? Okay. And how much time are you asking from them? Okay, 24 bucks, 30 minutes for room attendants who's getting paid 11 bucks an hour. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, the things that I've done in the past include everything from LinkedIn, which is extremely helpful uh, in terms of, sorry, guys, the, the advanced search feature, right? Like I know competitors, right? We're sitting in indeed. <laughs> um, but in terms of finding people with advanced search, if you want to find the very specific people, I think that's great. Um, I've done Craigslist ads. Um, yeah, they, they work. Um, there's a little bit more, you have some signal to noise issues, but they do work. Um, for that specifically, I mean, the other things that I've done, like I've done, I've even done LexisNexis. I've looked at trade magazines and then called people or have sent letters when I had to find like certain people. But this is a little different, right? Because it's, um, it's somebody who's getting paid only 11 bucks an hour. Right, yeah. Sure. Have you, so one thing that it makes me think of is if, if you could find somebody who used to or currently works in hospitality and maybe has even been a room attendant yeah. in the past and maybe worked their way up and to get them that way it's sort of one of their own kind or one of their people in a sense, reaching out to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you think about it, you don't even have need to have a staffing attendant do the interviews, just have them secure the appointment. Yeah, no, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. And that hasn't been successful? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Phone or in person? I feel like I'm a person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how also how are you paying them? Um, I, it, if it's like that bad, I would also go sit outside hotels, like for w as, as shift changes, and find them coming in and out of their cars. Um, you could also go s go uh, stay in a bunch of hotels and leave notes yeah. in the room for people. Um, <laughs> yeah, got to get somebody who works at a hotel. Um, I mean, I would also I would think about somebody who's worked at a hotel, then like head of housekeeping, and get them to just go reach out like people that they used to manage. Right, like if, if they like to their manager, they're probably gonna say yes to it. They're one, they're gonna respond. Two, they're more likely to say yes, and they're getting paid. Um, to me, it's almost like you can get one, and you might be able to get leverage to get like 10 or 20. Mm. That's where LinkedIn, I think, would be helpful to find the manager. Who would find the manager on LinkedIn? Welcome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't have a problem with that. That's not like, there's no. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, they came to us. So we actually started off identifying and tracking cattle for food safety. Um, my co-founder was born and raised on a cattle ranch. Um, it was, we played baseball together in college. It was the classic story of he was the engineer, I was the sales guy. Um, cattle didn't work out. But in the early days of cattle, we did a bunch of guerrilla marketing and got a lot of press, landed on some cover, covers of magazines. And the Jackson Laboratory, which is actually the fourth largest breeder of that, of that group of breeders, contacted us and said, hey, would you be willing to transfer, translate your technology from cattle to mice? And at the time, we were darlings of the startup world and said, thanks, but no thanks. And they sort of kept in touch. And about a year later, we had actually taken the company from 30 people down to two. Uh, so probably the worst day of my life. This was January of 08 when subprime was hitting. And Jackson Laboratory called us again out of nowhere. And they didn't know this. Um, but I was, I mean, it was just my co-founder and I not paying ourselves, sitting in our office, completely insolvent, probably 5x liabilities over cash um, on the books, and just not answering the phone because I was fighting off creditors. And I got a phone call, and I didn't recognize this. I knew who, like, the creditor phone calls were, um, and I didn't know this one. <laughs> so I answered, and it was, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was Jackson Laboratory. And they basically said, look, uh, we know you told us thanks but no thanks over a year ago. We've been, we've been piloting every technology that's available. We tried to build a few in-house, and we haven't been successful. Basically, we're willing to sponsor whatever feasibility study you spec out if you're just willing to give us your time and see if mice can work for you. And for us, I mean, it was just this golden parachute out of nowhere. So it was, of course, I think in like two or three weeks, we can get up there. And so we went up there, and the biggest thing that we realized was we thought they needed like that, that super advanced biocompatible RFID ink tattoo system, whereas they didn't. They needed something that was so much simpler. It was like Lamborghini to a bicycle. And we, we worked with them. They were absolutely wonderful. And it kind of, we made the turn and never looked back. Cool. Well, thank you. Hey, guys. I th uh, once again, a big thank you to uh, Mark Bidnowski. Thanks for your time and your story. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Shout out. Who, who's got, who's got something? You've got to get up on and up here, though. Yeah. Ten seconds to give your best shot.